And so, did you see a Wolverine? Did you manage to Jason, get that one checked on the list? The only Wolverine we saw, we we saw a stuffed one in this like restaurant. <laughs> uh, that was as close as I got. Uh, Wolverines. So I should mention Wolverines are like one of the hardest animals to see in the world. Um, an individual Wolverine has a home range of upwards of 75 square miles. And I once talked to a researcher who was tracking Wolverines and there was two interesting facts about him. One, he trapped grizzly bears and Wolverines in Wyoming for grizzly bears. He used a wooden cylinder trap that had a door that came down with steel bars for a Wolverine. He used a steel cylinder trap with steel bars that came down. Wow. Why the difference? Because a, a grizzly bear that weighs, you know, 2,000 pounds stays in that trap. It can't break out. A wolverine, which weighs, you know, 60 pounds maybe, will ch will destroy the entire wooden trap and chew its way out. Um, wow. It's pretty amazing. A wolverine, and then the other fact about wolverines is they're this little animal, yay big, um, you know, maybe three feet long. And yet they've been tracked going up and over the Tetons in a day. So going <laughs> over the mountains and back in a single day. I mean, you think about this little animal doing that, I mean, in snow and in the ice and it's right. incredible. So long story short, we didn't see one. They're very hard to see, but, um, we were certainly in the best place to see them that mm -hmm. is normal to access. And what's the um, sort of status of wolverines? What are their populations looking like? Great question. Um, unfortunately, wolverines are declining, and the reason for their decline has been attributed mostly to climate change. They're a species that, especially in the summertime, need snow. They, they need snow. They like to stay cool. They have a very thick coat, which is one of the reasons they mm -hmm. used to be trapped so heavily. But they like, they like being up high. So in the, in the winter time, they'll come down a little bit lower, but in the summer, they stay way up where you see the snow still on like the tops of the mountains. That's where Wolverines hang out. And as climate change has been occurring, I mean, for example, it's 90 degrees when we were in Alaska, 90 degrees oh. in Alaska. And so that's melting the snow higher, 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 yeah. less and less and less room for Wolverines to live. And other species like pikas and marmots are declining in similar ways, but the Wolverine had a chance to be listed under the Endangered Species Act uh, two years ago now, I think, and it was denied. Uh, Why? One of, the, one of the thoughts was that the ski industry wasn't having it. Um, places like Montana and Colorado, Idaho, where you have a thriving and booming ski industry, potentially threatened by restrictions on development due to the Wolverine, pushed against it. Um, you had a lot of ranchers and um, like-minded folks out west who didn't want another listed species potentially occurring on their land, especially one that ranges as far as a wolverine. I mean, that wolverine mm -hmm. ends up on their land. Mm -hmm. Drastically it, changes what you can do. It, it does. It, it could. It could change what you do. And yeah. there was just a lot of resistance. And I think any biologist who knows anything about wolverines knows it was justified to list them, but they didn't get listed. And it's a shame because they're a species that is one of the most remarkable, ferocious, intelligent species that lives in the United States, unanimously known to be declining, and here it's unprotected. You could, I, could, I could set a trap tomorrow in Montana and go out and, and trap one um, wow. by the leg, you know, a leg hold. Yeah. And how that's still okay is, you know. Well, and what's, what's gonna be the consequence if Jeez. we lose our wolverine populations, uh, what do they eat and what eats them and what kind of effects do they have on their ecosystems that are going to change? Any, any loss of a species is tragic, as you yeah. know. But especially large predators, top of the food chain animals, um, their loss is, is exponentially greater in terms of its impact on the ecosystem. What's unique about wolverines, which makes them even more valuable and more precious and more terrible um, if we were to lose them, is the fact that wolverines are predators, but they're also scavengers. They serve both roles about equally. So you have a species that is, is nature's garbage disposal of these huge carcasses, these elk, these caribou, these moose, and to the point where they'll, they'll actually chase off grizzly bears from kills. Um, oh, wow. Again, a species that is three feet long, yeah. grizzly bear away from something it killed. 
or its eating is insane. Um, but then they also, they, they, they predate other animals. And so, you know, all those species, their populations can increase and they eat plants and then there's less plants for other animals to eat and less birds like that Arctic warbler I mentioned before. And it's all connected. Everything is connected. It's, it's one big system and you lose an integral part of that system like a wolverine and, and everything else just starts to kind of crumble. And so to me, a wild species like a wolverine or a timber rattlesnake or these species that epitomize wild you lose them and you lose wild you you lose nature really yeah. um and so and then there's just the fact that wolverine is a badass animal like <laughs> right well, yeah you know exactly. bottom line like no above one wants to lose else. it yeah above all else <laughs> it's a cool animal and we shouldn't lose it so um yeah it's it's interesting and i think trips like the one we took to alaska kind of illustrate those things because you can think uh, it would be a bummer if we lost a wolverine but whatever but then you see it up close and you see the impact that that loss would have um and it it makes you feel it more and you really want to do something about it um, well and i think something that gets overlooked a lot in the conversation is when you do lose a species like that that is keeping a lot of things under control um the energy resources needed to then compensate for that are incredible as far as needing to maintain um, the organisms that then start to um, really go crazy in their populations because they're not being kept in check that are herbiv herbiv herbivorous and uh, wiping out plant populations. Um, you inevitably start losing all sorts of interesting um, native plants and a lot of times rare or uncommon plants, um, which by the way, um, on the topic of plants, we don't know hardly anything about plants, as uh, particularly from my perspective, like the biochemistry of plants, um, what they're actually doing in their environments besides just being food. They have all of all of these complex interactions. Um, they emit chemical compounds that are literally influencing the behavior of animals around. Um, not to mention the fact that so many of our medicines and everything come from different plants. And so part of this cascade of effects is needing to make sure that once that uh, big predator is gone, that we don't start losing all of these plant, this plant biodiversity that could be enormously valuable. I think the, the stat is that we've, you know, really deeply researched about 6% of plant species in existence. Yeah. Um, if that, yeah. And so then there's there's this huge resource need to start to um, try to conserve those things, try to control other populations, putting in all of this extra energy that before was handled by this population of a single organism naturally in just the way that it's adapted to do things. Um, I've got a perfect example, Jason, of, of exactly what you just talked about. In Hawaii, there are species now um, of plants that were thought extinct and they're they're growing on the edges of cliffs to access these plants the only reason the plants exist is because they're growing on the edges of cliffs mm, yeah okay to access the plants to survey them you must rappel down the cliff you know 100 200 feet dangling from a rope naturally these plants were pollinated by the native honey creepers of hawaii hawaii has lost more of its native species than any other place on earth any i didn't realize that wow oh yeah and and their their bird fauna is just been it's just been devastated now there's no honey creepers to pollinate this certain species of plant people have to repel down and individually pollinate these plants now how sustainable is that long term right we could have just protected this bird like you just said and nature took care of itself and here we are now kind of you know, and how much does that cost? That's the right. other thing. How much does that cost? Is it is it more cost effective to protect the species in the first place so the system's intact? Or is it better to not so worry about that and then after the fact have to mm -hmm. repel off a cliff and hand pollinate a plant? <laughs> right. Those are the types of questions that I think are important to think about um, as conservationists and as, as just a citizen of the United States because me and you are paying for all that stuff. Right. Um, that should 
be a cause of concern for people. I mean, people care about education and, and healthcare and all those things. I think the environment should be right there with those.